This is episode number 186 of the Mixology Talk podcast. And now we're just getting into the holidays. Uh, so we're definitely in the mindset of getting gifts and sort of think about what we're going to get people for the holidays. So I thought it'd be really great to bring in author, social media influencer, businesswoman extraordinaire, Natalie from Beautiful Booze to talk about her new book and also some ideas around gift giving for the holidays. We have a lot of tips just around a lot of different things. Uh, so hopefully you'll find uh, a lot of the information really interesting. So uh, yeah, let's get into it, shall we? Hey everyone, welcome back to the Mixology Talk podcast. I We have a special guest uh, for the podcast, but um, as many of you know, every month we kind of focus on one particular topic. Right now we're going to be focusing in on gifts and gift guides for the holidays. I know we're a bit early, but it's going to happen very, very quickly. Um, so joining me today is Natalie Miglarini. Did I say that right? Yes, who said it right? <laughs> oh, thank you, the first one. <laughs> so Natalie from Beautiful Booth, thank you so much for uh, for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. It's great to reunite after we, you know, have talked and seen each other at Tales the last several years. <laughs> well, it's great to have a virtual discussion. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, uh, we've had we've we've chatted for many many years, just being in the social media space. Um, and I'm so impressed on what you're doing. I mean, your your social media influence is is more popular than ever. Um, and the reason I have you on here is not to talk about social media, um, but you just launched, first of all, a absolutely gorgeous uh, cocktail book. Um, so congratulations on that. And uh, I think it's m very fitting as we go into the holiday gift giving uh, season that this could be a really, really good uh, gift for people. So um, yeah, excited to chat with you about all things cocktails and cocktail books. Yeah, so the book came out around August 25th. Um, wanted to set it up for obviously the holidays. It's something that people, you know, people, a lot of people love getting, giving alcohol, bottles of alcohol, but it's great to really include something like a cocktail book. So I think this is a great gift and right on point for what you're going for this month. And, you know, I always thought about for a really long time after I started Beautiful Booze, which was essentially a blog um, seven years ago. And then, you know, it morphed into an Instagram account because that was right I don't know. I felt like that platform was made for me because I was looking to put up beautiful cocktail photos and Instagram is so visual, visually focused on photos. And so for me, it's taken me about seven years to get here to a point where I was able to work with a publisher to release something called Beautiful Booze, which really represents my brand and brings those cocktails into something tangible that people can flip through and have at home at their fingertips. Because we all know there's no way you can search for a um, recipe on Instagram. And even though I do have about a thousand recipes on my website, when you're looking for something, it's always nice to have that book in front of your face. Absolutely. And I will say I was looking through this um, over the last week or so, and I, I know your Instagram account really well. And it's one thing you do really exceptionally is your photography is is spot on. It's always, always a beautiful photo. Um, and this book is absolutely no exception. Um, it, it is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. Um, so I kind of want to talk about uh, how you got started in this crazy world of of cocktails like what yeah. you said you started a blog but what made you focus in on cocktails yeah so i get this question all the time because people that just find me through instagram um you know they think that i'm a bartender which i i mean i guess i could be now but i'll tell you the difference between me and a bartender a bartender um they can make they tend to be able to make drinks at volume i'm used to making drinks at home so i'm used to making between one and four drinks at one time i do not make cocktails at volume 
I take my time. This is like a leisure activity for me, even though the photography feels more like a job. The recipe creation for me is one of the funnest parts. And so around seven years ago in Seattle is when I started this. And I don't know what happened, but I just dreamed up this name. And the reason that I was thinking about something is because at the time I was working at the university and I, I worked in public health, writing grants for five years. And before that I worked in, I worked at like three universities doing the same thing. But my, my last job was five years here in Seattle. And I don't know, I just was always looking for that creative outlet outside my job because my job was more like spreadsheet oriented. And I always had these, I had a lot of these dinner parties, themed dinner parties from places that I, that I got the inspiration from, from places that I traveled. So I was always thinking about having a fun signature cocktail when people got there, having a punch and so I did a lot of this stuff and I, I had a huge bourbon collection and I started thinking about cocktails to make with bourbon. Although I used to just sip and craft cocktails started ramping up. So mm -hmm. I started thinking about ways I could make them at home. So that's really what started this when I, and then eventually I got laid off from my job. So I thought, you know, I saw on Instagram that there was a lot of food bloggers in the space and they weren't necessarily chefs, but they were putting out these recipes with beautiful photos. And I thought to myself, I'm going to do the same thing, <laughs> but with cocktails, because that seems really fun right up my alley and something that I wanted to do for a couple months while I was looking for another job. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just started, my friends had always asked for recipes. I just was like, I'm going to put this on a WordPress site and then I'm going to try to take some photos with this camera I got for to use on vacation. And then it really just started taking off from there. Very cool. So how did you get into like, this is your full-time job? Because at this point you were still kind of like, looking for another job and still kind of doing this thing on the side. When did you say, you know what, this is, this is working. I'm in like, was there kind of a, a pivotal moment for you? Yeah. I still feel like I'm trying to figure that out <laughs> <We're seven laughs> years later. Um, this space is really difficult because you work with a lot of alcohol brands who have their campaigns for me run through PR agencies. So it's a complicated system to begin with. And I won't, get into it but um i make a lot of my money by creating recipes for different alcohol brands and doing photography and some stuff like that that i do for brands you won't necessarily see on my account because i do it for them with their branding so i first started out getting a couple of uh gigs writing recipes and doing photography for websites mm -hmm. so i would get that and then i started getting some clients where i ran their social media and did content for them so all of the things that i started out doing to make money were independent of actually my instagram account and what i did got it and what I started out doing is offering my audience because on as consumers are consuming so much information on Instagram, people are scrolling like maniacs. You have to offer your audience something. So when I started, I was doing five recipes a week. Um, new recipes a week just to give my audience that Monday through Friday. I had people coming back every day to see what cocktail I made for that day. So there was this anticipation factor. So a lot of stuff I did at the beginning to try to see if I could make this work. And it was a hobby was investing in myself. So I mean, I invested about a year salary, what I made at the university into getting this up off the ground. And then, like I said, I had a set amount of money coming in a month for running other people's social media and contributing to websites. 
And then about two years into it, I started getting some campaigns in terms of working with liquor brands to promote, essentially do an ad on my Instagram. And that's how I started making more money. And then just when anybody brand or person came to me and said, can you do this? I, I always said, yes, yes, I can do this. And I still do things today. Even this week, I've worked with White House Black Market, which is a, a women's retail store to pair cocktails with their blouses. That's something I've never done before. I've never worked with a clothing company or anything like that. But it's, it's one of those things where you don't want to limit yourself into a box. And that's how you can make connections and find jobs that you never thought were an option. And most of the time for these jobs, companies reach out to me. So that's where I have a lot of anxiety still to this day. Is there going to, is somebody going to come to me for a job today? Because when you approach a lot of brands saying you want to work with them, they just keep you in mind till they have a specific campaign coming up. So it's really hard to gauge the consistent work on this. And that's a lot of the stress from making this into a full-time job. Sure. And I remember this, um, you know, with, um, with consulting, um, you know, when I started consulting with bars and restaurants, um, the majority of my time isn't actually doing the job. It's prospecting. And that's the thing I think a lot right. of people don't understand about owning your own business and offering a service is it's not a turnkey. You can't just open, you know, put a shingle out and people just start lining up. Um, a lot of your time is marketing and gaining new customers and building your reputation and, you know, getting stuff on the books, um, you know, and uh, even to this day, it, it's a significant part of just running your own company. Um, yeah, it's great. It's, you know, people see the Instagram photos and they're like, oh, you're so lucky. Oh, my God. But <laughs> yeah. they don't realize all the work that goes behind that one shoot. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, no, I, it's it's it, seven years in the making for an overnight success, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's crazy. It's very, very crazy. And yes, I self-taught myself everything. And from the home bartender point of view, I kind of felt like that was beneficial to me when I was creating recipes because I have a different point of view. And even right now, I feel as though I have a different point of view where I've done a lot of traveling around the world, going into bars, showcasing bartenders and their cocktails on my account too. So I understand the the industry perspective, but I also understand the consumer perspective. So I do think that a lot of brands want to work with me because I do have those two things combined. And I don't know that anybody else has that in on the home consumer as well as the industry and being able to marry those two voices together to reach that those two different audiences. So I under I have the perspective coming from a home bartender, but then I also have the experience of probably I wanted to add this up about how many bars I went to, <laughs> but I have no idea. I do know that I've been to over a hundred distilleries around sure. the world. So I have that knowledge, but I try to stay true to the mission of beautiful booze from the beginning, mm -hmm. which was not overcomplicating and not having to have a background in bartending to make a cocktail, because just like in the food world, if you want to make something at home, you can teach yourself. Yeah. And it's Absolutely. the same with cocktails and just emphasizing that you don't have to have a lot of ingredients. You don't have to have a specific brand to make a cocktail, you can use whatever brand you like and the cocktail will be good. And with that being said, that is my philosophy for this book because unless it was unless it was super necessary, like for instance, Campari or Aperol, mm -hmm. there are no brands in my book. 
And there's a reason for that. And people disagree with me. And I don't really care because <laughs> I've made cocktails with every, almost every freaking spirit on the shelf. And if I have a favorite gin and I make a martini with my favorite gin, then that's going to taste good to me. Right. If you have your favorite gin and it's different than mine and you make one of the cocktails in the book, well, that cocktail is probably going to taste good because you like that gin. Right. And I get it. Somebody's going to come at me about, well, different botanicals. It is. It, <laughs> that's true. But I really believe in this. <laughs> well, it's a good point, though. Like, if you have a, a spirit that you gravitate towards, it's just going to be better when you make it with that spirit. It just makes sense. That's too funny. So um, <laughs> did you always have this idea, like, when you started off and you started doing your photography for brands and it started evolving into your own social media handle. It, was that when you're like, okay, down the pipeline, I can see saving all these photos and publishing a book out of it. Or was this like no. a, a purposeful, I, like two years in the making kind of thing where you said, Oh, I should probably do a book now. Yeah. I have a lot of imposter syndrome since I come from a government background and my previous experience working in government for 12 years as anybody else, I had consistent pay, consistent, everything was pretty consistent. And I never thought, even when I started Beautiful Booze, like, can I run a business? I don't think so. I never even thought that was an option for me. And I don't know why I limited myself. I just went to college for something, was on this path of having a job, working that job and then just doing whatever the hell I wanted to on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And I had the same thing with this. I had so many people looking at my photography on Instagram saying they loved it and how I should write a book. I probably, probably somebody told me that at least once a day. <laughs> and I started thinking about it. Yeah, that seems great. You know, I would love to write a book, but I was so busy traveling and just trying to stay afloat with the business. Yeah. Never thought twice about it. But over the years, I've been um, approached by different publishers wanting me to write books about different things. And a lot of the contracts weren't great. And honestly, they were wanting specific themes like, can you write a book about brunch or whatever? Right. And what I was looking for for myself, and this is a lesson to think about, sometimes when you hear the word book and a publisher says, we want you to write a book, you think, oh my God, yes, without even thinking twice. Yeah, I want to be an author. Like, oh my God, they think I can write a book? That sounds amazing. Right. But you do have to think about even though it, cocktails are light and they're fun and this whole industry is all about that, there is other sides to trying to run a business and figure out what's going to be best for you. So I just felt like I'm going to hold off. The timing was never right. And honestly, I wanted to work with a publisher that let me write Beautiful Booze, the book, not the brunch book or right. the highball book. I wanted a book that represented me, my brand and what I do. And I didn't want to put myself into a, such a niche that, you know, I need to promote like a brunch book, which I love brunch cocktails, but I wanted this flagship signature, beautiful booze book. And sometimes you have to wait for that right opportunity to come by. So, you know, six years into this is when, the publisher came to me and said, you want, have you thought about writing a book? And I said, yeah, the contracts have always sucked and nothing's been good. So I've said no. So I uh, talked to them and they gave me like a hundred percent creative freedom to come up with whatever I wanted to do. And this was the best fit for me. Right. Yeah. It's funny. Cause we get pitches all the time. The same, same thing. We get pitches all the time. Like, Hey, could you write this, you know, book? And I'm like, probably, but yeah. I just <laughs> don't find it. I mean, you're going to find it in the bargain bargain section of Barnes and Noble right. in six months. 
and I, I could see it. I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I don't really have a lot of interest in that, but um, you know, once again, opportunities will exist and they'll present themselves if you just keep going through your, you know, going towards your destination. So highly recommend the book for anybody that hasn't got it yet. Um, and uh, so you kind of touched on a couple of points here that I want to kind of yeah. um, talk to you about. And that is you've kind of explored the, the, the wide world of spirits out there. You've had your palette on just about everything under the sun I can imagine. Um, when you were going through your travels and, uh, you know, creating cocktails, is there certain um, drinks or certain ingredients that you were just like, wow, that's super impressive. That stands out to me as a really interesting and fun spirit or mixer or, or liqueur. Is there a couple of things that kind of really just kind of grab you and surprise you? Like in the book or just in general? Uh, both actually. Okay. Well, so for one thing, I, a lot of these drinks, and if you read the little captions in the book, they tell a story about the inspiration of cocktails. Mm -hmm. One ingredient that I discovered anyway, so this all started in Paris in a, in a tiki bar in Paris called Dirty Dick. And um, <laughs> the owner is American, and he... Um, made me one of his favorite drinks there, which was a drink that was a cross between a pina colada and a daiquiri. And I thought, this is amazing. Wow. And so it became one of my signature drinks that I tried to recreate. So when I was doing pop-ups around the world, I had this standard drink called Insta Vacay, which is really... You know, you take one sip and you feel like you're on an Insta vacay, inspired by that bar, Dirty Dick in Paris. And what I did is I took, I wanted to figure out a way to make a cross between a pina colada and a daiquiri, taking out the heaviness of the coconut cream. So what I did is I um, essentially found this Stig and Fancy's plantation pineapple rum and it's known in the book stig and fancy's dark pineapple rum i had to name the brand because there's nothing else like it it's in the book and several recipes in the insta vacay it's the base spirit so you're getting a pineapple but dry pineapple flavor from this rum and then i chose to put in a coconut syrup which is really amazing, and then lime juice. So it goes on the profile of, the, of a daiquiri, rum, sugar, lime, except we put in good coconut syrup to give really tropical vibes. So that is a cocktail that's three ingredients, and I love it. The pineapple rum adds a little bit of that pineapple tropical flavor, the coconut syrup, and the lime juice. That sounds delicious. Yeah, so that is a drink that's one of my favorites because I love daiquiris. And so I do think that ingredient is a high quality dark rum where they add in pineapples. It's just something that's that that gives your cocktail a lot of flavor. Yeah, I've had a couple of um, uh, pineapple uh, rums uh, and they're astounding. They, they surprise me how good they are. Yeah, yeah. So that's something that I've discovered and I've, I've visited where they make that there it's in, it's actually in cognac. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they make the rum somewhere else and they bring it in, but they finish it there. So that's something that I, one of my favorite cocktails. Excellent. <laughs> was there, uh, has there any, uh, other ingredient that you've come by that's just like, this is, completely different than you. And I remember the first time I had, uh, I, this is kind of passe at this point, but green chartreuse, the first time I had green chartreuse, it just blew my mind. Like, th what is this thing? Like, you know, most bars, it's on the bottom shelf, it's covered in dust at that point anyways. And I was like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever had in, in my mouth, like ever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that from France, you get a lot of these liqueurs that are super old, made by monks or whatever. Mm -hmm. They were used for medicine that just adds such a dimension of flavor. I mean, 
Campari is just that too, even though it's Italian. I actually went to that place where they make chartreuse. Mm -hmm. I came out, maxed out my credit card because (laughs) you could get all of these different chartreuses that they make there. But I'll tell you what. So I feel like the yellow chartreuse for the home bartender is so magical in cocktails and I like the green too, but I think um, coming in as an entry level home bartender, the mellowness of the yellow chartreuse and what it adds to cocktails, it's so good. So you will find the yellow chartreuse in several of the cocktails in the book. I just caught like, my eye. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> yeah, I just like the delicate flavor. I think because in the bartending industry, Um, Green chartreuse almost is like cultish favorite among bartenders. Mm -hmm. I do think that the yellow chartreuse falls under the radar, but I think it is so good and so delicate when it's used in cocktails. Yeah, I agree with you. And it it adds a nice kind of subtle sophistication to a cocktail um, in complexity. I I think it's very much underrated as well. Um, So one of the other things I want to ask you, and this is kind of aside from the book, because uh, I think the book is on its own, it's a great book. But um, the thing that I've always loved about your your Instagram handle um, is the quality of photos that you take. It's not just, uh, I need to put a cocktail together, so I'm gonna slap something together. It's very thoughtful. Um, and the photos that come out of it are really, really great. So I'm hoping I can kind of pick your brain on some lessons that you've learned, some tips that you could offer people to kind of up their game from the cocktail photo perspective. Yeah, so there's a couple things about the photography that I take. I noticed early on that I wanted to have an edge on the photography and make it enticing for people to want to make the cocktail. But at the same time, I did not want my Instagram account to necessarily look so like a magazine. You know, you flip through magazines, you see food and it looks beautiful and amazing but it's it's it kind of intimidates you so i wanted to come for an in-between level not that i don't want my photos to look good i think that they look good i just don't want it to look almost fake Mm -hmm. i want it to feel approachable still um so because i lived out so after after having beautiful booze for two years in seattle i know i need to make a lifestyle change so I sold everything I had and I moved and I decided to just not have a apartment or a house. And I just lived out of my suitcase for the last five years. So the challenging part of that is having the equipment, carrying everything you own, which means carrying all the photography equipment. So some people think you need a lot of lighting. You need this and that. Not necessarily. I don't have, any of that until the last year I did invest in a flash because we were taking photos in dark bars and needed it for that. But just for the home bartending for six years, I never used any lighting and I just, I don't know, natural lights the best if you have it, but I just feel like you don't have to have $10,000 worth of equipment to do something amazing. And from carrying everything I own, I had to trim down pretty deep. And to this day, even though I've been trapped in Seattle for the last six months, I have one flash that one little tiny flash from pro photo that I use that I think makes a huge difference in the photography. But the other thing that I think has helped me is living out of my suitcase and having to do the cocktail photography on the road, which means I don't have a studio or a living room or a space I can consistently count on where I know the lighting, I know the angles, I know the tables, I know how this is going to shoot. Like it's, I don't have that consistent space. So I think moving every week or every day to a hotel or an Airbnb has taught me to be very flexible and versatile and helped me grow as a photographer because I do feel like I can shoot in almost any space because I've had to 
Mm -hmm. I've had no choice. I've had to. I've had to shoot in hotels a ton. And if you think about it, uh, they're not easy. So I've had to try to do everything possible to make something work. Absolutely. So is there, um, because I know like there are certain people that aim for a very specific time of day because the natural light is kind of the best there. Do you have a favorite kind of like hour or two within a day where you, you think the, the lighting and the angle, the sun and everything else is kind of your prime target? I don't because I'm like a hot mess and I'm just trying to make it to get everything ready for the shot. So I'm like, this is, this is what it is. And this is what I have to work with. Like, again, I haven't been in a consistent place enough to have it. I do feel like when I'm looking outside right now and I started my business in Seattle, I do feel like because it is cloudy and overcast a lot here, the diffusion of light through these clouds is really nice. Um, So anytime you don't have direct sunlight, it's much easier to shoot when you have a diffusion where Mm -hmm. you do have a lot of light that's going through clouds. Um, That's, I, that's, I like that kind of light because you don't have anything extreme, right? You know, you direct sunlight is very difficult to shoot in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to I want to pick your brain on what you have in your travel kit right now. Well, not right yeah. now because we're not traveling. But when you travel, what is the like the top three uh, piece of equipment that you always have to have with you? Uh, yeah. So I keep the same thing at, even when I travel as I do right now. Okay. Because that's just I've been able to execute it with less is more. So. I shoot with a Sony A9, and the reason I sh- I started with the Canon, then I went to Nikon, and for the last three, four years, I've been shooting with a Sony because I do travel, and I need a mirrorless body, which is much slimmer than your standard DSLR. Mm-hmm. Um, so I shoot with that. It's very Sony cameras are really, really good in low light. And so I consider if I have to shoot in a dark hotel room, but also be being able to have the flexibility to shoot in bars, which are very low light. Mm -hmm. Um, I also have a travel, um, tripod that I really like. Um, even for someone that has a stable place, if you ever want to shoot in a bar or shoot somewhere out in nature, this travel tripod is amazing and it goes, it's just that the travel, I mean, it, it goes down very slim Mm -hmm. and it's just, it will make anybody's life easier. Even if you live in a bigger space, you know, so that a travel tripod, um, and I do like this little, now that I've gotten used to it, this pro photo flash, this little pro photo flash. Um, it's just really nice to have that extra light. Mm-hmm. And w- when you do have a lot of direct light coming in one side of the photo, you can use this um, flash to make different um if you want to do shadows or anything that looks really cool in photos like you know you have like stem glasses and you can make them have shadows sure. this this flash can help with that oh, very once cool. you get a little bit more advanced and understand light sources and stuff like that um a lot of it's been trial and error for me but i do like I'll tell you another reason why this flash has been helpful when I do work with a lot of brands and I'm photographing bottles, bottles are really hard to photograph. Obviously they're made of glass. So they're, they've got a lot of, um, shadows and a lot of times you just can't get a really nice shot of the bottle, like a crisp shot without reflections and shadows. And when you do point this um, flash at the bottle, it will make it look 10 times better. Nice. So, but a, a regular person, 
doesn't necessarily this is because i do this for my job and i and i and i want it to be the best that i can but i still use all of this stuff can be fit in a very very small bag i still use just minimal equipment if i if i brought in a couple other things i could go next level sure but, but again and, and I use, this is the same equipment I use to shoot every single photo in the book. So, you know, I just feel like, am I going to get that much more of an outcome spending another $10,000 bringing in light boxes and all of this stuff? I, again, I don't want my vibe to be oh, every single photo is a magazine. That is not my real life. Right. Yeah, no, I, it, it sounds like you're kind of like really focusing on the approachable aspect of, of your cocktails and your brand. And I think, yeah. you know. Not that I want to put out a shitty cocktail, but at the same time, I don't want to ha shoot my cocktails in a studio setting. That is not me. Right, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I just want to recap because I think you got, gave us yeah. a lot of good tips here. First of all, uh, as far as tips go, natural sunlight is best i like natural lighting yeah for in terms of the timing if you shoot that happy hour golden hour late afternoon lighting is really really nice got it so that's usually right around dusk and dawn kind of or uh, you know when the sun's starting to set right yeah perfect okay um then as far as equipment goes um you travel with the sony a9 you have a travel tripod which i'm going to pick your brain on for a brand because uh okay. i've had a struggle with tripods in the past i probably have about five of them back here in my studio so uh I'll, I'll, this I'll, one's the the best thing i've ever yeah so I'll, I'll shoot you an email and i'll include it in the show notes yeah uh because it's definitely something on my radar and then a pro photo flash um for your just adding additional lighting uh when yeah and there's a cheaper one i use pro photo but there's one that's almost exactly the same that's cheaper got it okay well i, I will hit you up uh, on email for some links on this one and we'll yeah. the show notes um and then the last question i have for you um is imagine like somebody's giving this this book as a gift uh to somebody they care about what would you add to that to make it a kind of a more complete like cocktail experience uh, for that person? Yeah, I think it's it's a really great addition to like a holiday gift basket or just, you know, even if you're going to somebody's house, like what can you add to this to really make it a well-rounded gift? One thing um, that may be nice is adding an approachable bottle that someone may have never had before. For example, I had mentioned the Stiggins Fancy Dark Pineapple Rum, which is a great bottle um, that you can use in cocktails for anything that calls for rum. I've used this in a Negroni, like a rum Negroni, but then it adds a little bit of those tropical vibes. So I think, and you know, their packaging is really great for that bottle. So it, it's, it's, it would be a really nice gift. Um, another thing that I've used in here is a creme de banana liqueur, which is the Tempest Fugit. Mm -hmm. I actually just made a cocktail, which is on the cover called I like booze. And it has, um, that creme de banana in it, but I couldn't find that in Seattle. So I got a banana liqueur. And so I got the Gifford one. Mm -hmm. Giffords. Yeah. So either one of those is really nice too, because adding a little bit of that banana liqueur to a stir drink, like an old fashioned or something is, is a really nice twist. And someone might not have that bottle. Um, it's something that I didn't have until I bought it and I was obsessed. And then I like started putting in everything. So like my book is a result of things that I picked up that I was like, I'm obsessed with this. I'm going to put it in everything. <laughs> See how like you can make like banana daiquiris or like, I don't know, you can put it in a lot of different things. That It sounds weird. Some people might be like, no, I don't like banana flavor, but I do because I think it's hard to find 
brands that replicate a flavor like banana that's not artificial tasting. Banana is one of those iconic flavors that are just like, yeah. there's that one artificial banana flavor and it tastes it tastes like candy, like a really bad candy, and it's in everything. So if you can find something good, and I know uh, Tempest Fugit is one of my favorite producers. They do such a great job with pretty much all the things they carry. Yeah, uh, and the reason I wanted to mention them as well, because their packaging is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Their bottles. So showing up with one of their bottles, like the creme de banana, which is the spice, it's so good, and that's in the book and several things mm -hmm. it's it looks like a gift just the bottle does so that's that would be a great bottle to pair with this book and mm -hmm. then um you know mixing glasses are nice because a lot of people don't have those or even a really nice shaker is something that i think it's hard to find because there's a huge gap in quality on shakers yeah absolutely cool well uh that i think that would make a pretty stinking good gift if i got that as a set i'd be like oh my god this is awesome and the fact that you know if uh somebody gives me cream to banana i'd be like how am i going to use this but now you got the book walking well, through a couple of cocktails game game over i think that's a great gift <laughs> No, yeah, I think like adding that, like I said, even to just like some classic cocktails, like a daiquiri or like even stirred cocktails, like an old fashioned, it yeah. just, oh my God, it will take you off of a drink rut. Well, and let me ask you this question because I always find this to be a very telling answer. What have you tried with a creme de banana that absolutely didn't work? Like, I, I don't know. I would, <laughs> I haven't, I, you know what? I haven't tried it. Honestly, like I said yesterday or two days ago, I got this Gifford banana liqueur and I just picked up the bottle and drank straight out of it because I was kind of like, I want to know what this tastes like. And it yeah. was, it was literally like an alcoholic banana syrup. And I was like, Oh my God, you, you your mind starts racing. Like, okay. Like I can put this in everything and I'm like, Ooh, this could be put in food. Like rest. I mean, and that flavor, like, again, if it's done right, it just, I think goes well in a lot of things. So I don't have a, a fail from that. I'm sure there was when I was creating the book, but I, you know, I put that in the back of my mind. <laughs> but I mean, obviously if you're mixing it with something crazy, I mean, I even, the 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 drink on the cover which is the recipe i like booze because it has five different booze uh -huh. five different alcohols in it which is not reflective of my book this is a more advanced nightcap but mm. that that cocktail has campari dry vermouth um campari dry vermouth the banana liqueur and liqueur 43 and mezcal Oh, and wow. that entire combination comes together and tastes so good. I just made that cocktail yesterday. Um, so, you know, it's about experimenting, but sure. the thing with the banana stuff is less is really more. I think that's where you can screw it up <laughs> because you want to use it in a way that complements like a base spirit, like your mezcal or your tequila or your rum, because right. that flavor can really, if you if you put too much in, it can really overpower the rest of your drink. So that's what I would say to that. And also, I just thought about this. Another thing you could add with with the book would be like, if you wanted to give somebody like a couple of good vermouths, that's also a great um, gift. And I think if you're looking for something reasonably priced, there's a wide range of really great vermouths on the market that are reasonably priced. And also you can find a lot of them if you're in a state where they don't sell hard liquor in the grocery store, you're able to find like sherries or vermouths in the grocery store, which is really nice if you don't want to have to make another stop. Right. Do you have a particular brand that you gravitate towards? Because I know for me, it's, I mean, Carpano is kind of its own thing. 
And uh, I always like the Dolan products. Um, is there any vermouth that you kind of sticks out for you? Well, right now I have the, um, well, for the sweet vermouth, I like the Koki. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, I do for the dry vermouth right now. I have the um, Dolan mm -hmm. also. They do a great but, job. Yeah. I also, I just used a sweet vermouth, the Martini Reserve, Rosso mm -hmm. Reserva. That's a really nice bottle as well. So there's a lot of stuff on the market that's really great. And whether you decide to go French or Italian, they're both pretty good. Excellent. Well, we'll include all those in the show notes. I can't thank you enough uh, for hanging out with me. I feel like we were just kind of catching up for the last for the last hour. So I definitely appreciate it. Um, and then how can people find your book? How can people get uh, to know you a little bit more? Yeah. So the best way to find me is I'm usually on Instagram 24 hours a day at beautiful booze. All my handles on social media are at beautiful booze. Um, also on my website, is www.beautifulbooze.com. There's a link to buy my book. Um, so, you know, it's available most places online, most bookstores. Um, but using the link from my website would be most appreciated for me because it is affiliate link. So it's helpful for that. So yeah. And any questions on cocktails or if you have ingredients and you're not just sure what to make or any other questions you may have for me, you can go on Instagram and DM me. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me. And yeah, I appreciate being able to talk about the book and like the inception of beautiful booze. It's always interesting <laughs> to think about how you start and, and what goes into it and recollect on just the the past so i appreciate being able to come on here and talk about some of the ups and downs and not feeling like i have to be filtered yeah no absolutely and, and i i think it's really fascinating because uh you know we've we've known each other for a long time and i don't think i've ever asked that question of you like how did this whole thing start so it's really fascinating to to uh to hear it uh kind of like from conception to kind of launching a book so i definitely appreciate yeah. it of so, course well thank you again i will have all of those uh links in the show notes so you can definitely go check those out and uh we have to do this again it, it was great yeah. to up with you totally next time i'm gonna have a cocktail in my hand <laughs> definitely we'll, we'll have that much later in the day for sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right thanks again natalie thank you so much i appreciate it So once again, thanks to Natalie from Beautiful Booze for joining us on this podcast. I know we kind of went all over the place um, as far as some of the topics uh, we covered, but she is a really interesting person and I think there was a lot of information, hopefully, that people find useful. Um, so this is her book. Definitely go check it out. And we'll have links in the show notes over at mixologytalk.com slash 186 uh, to where you can pick up this book and the camera gear she recommends and all the fun stuff that we talked about in this podcast. Uh, so yeah, check it out over at mixologytalk.com slash 186. Now, I know we're starting to creep into the holidays and uh, you're starting to think about what you're gonna get for that cocktail lover in your family. Um, so yeah, definitely go check out our bar tools over at shop.barabove.com. I think we have some of the best bar tools in the industry, but once again, I'm biased, uh, but you can check it out for yourself and tell us what you think. Um, so yeah. Head on over to shop.barabove.com and uh, hope you enjoy them as much as I do. Cheers, everyone.